welcome to my Bitcoin story. I'm so excited to have this wonderful guest uh, in here, Max Kaiser and Stacy Herbert from Kaiser Report and also the host of Orange Bill Podcast. <laughs> welcome to the show, Max and Stacy. We're yeah. so happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, Max and Stacy consider to be the Bitcoin evangelists for. Uh, you know, converting people around the world to Bitcoin every day. So, you know, it's it's a, a pleasure is mine to have you here too. Um, so, yeah, I think I think uh, we can start first. You know, to uh, listen to your story. You know, like how uh, how did you f- learn about Bitcoin? Because uh, from the to the moon story, you said that you learned it through John Matona. But uh, maybe you can share the whole experience. You know what makes you invite John Matona, and what or what was uh, going through your mind at that time when John Matona explained to you about Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, well Max, what do, you, do you do? You want to start here? Uh, sure. So, uh, Stacy said she was booking John Matonis on the Kaiser report. This was back in 2011. And she said uh, he he wants to talk about something called Bitcoin. And it sounds like what you did at the Hollywood Stock Exchange back in the 1990s, uh, because I I have a patent on a digital currency, a virtual currency and a trading system. And I was uh, I had a company in Los Angeles at that time called the Hollywood Stock Exchange. And so we booked him on the show. And yeah, it was uh, fascinating to me. Immediately started to understand how this was a, a, a vast improvement on the idea of a virtual currency. And so we immediately started reporting on it. Yeah. And so John had written to me, sent me an email asking uh, to speak about Bitcoin. And he said, described it as a digital currency. So that's why I assumed it was like the Hollywood dollar on the Hollywood Stock Exchange. But you know, during the interview, and if you watch the whole thing, you can see Max is starting to understand, like, it's not like the Hollywood dollar and that it's actually much bigger and, 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 and better. And, you know, the thing for me is I had worked in Hollywood as a script, you know, advisor, essentially like a development girl, they call it. And, um, you know, we, when we were making films or television projects, you know, you often do like audience reaction, like you show it to a select audience to see if the film works and which ending should you use instead? Do they respond better to that ending or this ending? So, you know, I'm always interested in the audience response as well, like how they respond to certain things. And when when we did the the interview with John Matonis, like the, the response and the comments under the YouTube are just, like so over the top, like I, we had never seen any sort of response like that was just filled with hate, a lot of hate of like mm. calling it a shit coin, by the way, and just saying like, what is this? It's obviously a scam. You know, if, if 21 million coins, it's worth $50 million. Whoever created this is running off with $50 million. Like this is a big scam. <laughs> So just the fact that, you know, at that point we had been doing our show for two years and the reaction had never been so overwhelming and so negative. So it prompted me to like, well, what did I miss about this story? Like, why are people so upset about some coin? Like, it seems weird. And, you know, obviously you go down the rabbit hole as everybody does. Mind you, the rabbit hole wasn't so deep back then and wide like today. There's just so much more content to read and explore. And, you know, you're kind of only on your own back then. Mm. So when after seeing like all the negative responses um, and you said you go to into a rabbit hole, did you did you guys like bought it immediately or you took it like step back? um and then buy it later we ended up with uh some coins actually because in a few months we went to uh i, I, I was a speaker at the first conference in prague and uh tony Gallippi, who was starting bitpay at the time to get us to speak at this event and he wanted to pitch us on investing on his in his company he sent us 800 bitcoin 
to cover the uh, the, the flight. And um, so we still have uh, some of those coins. So yeah, we were uh, accumulating from an early stage. And it was kind of difficult to find places to buy Bitcoin back then, of course. There weren't, uh, you know, I guess Mt. Gox was really the only, the only available place at that time. And it was very glitchy even back then. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to add as well that, you know, all that hate in the comments on under the YouTube, it was at that point, our content on Kaiser Report had been all about, you know, anti-central banks and stuff like that. But, you know, as the, an alternative was gold. So there were a lot of gold bugs in our audience in particular. So that still continues to this day, this gold bug versus Bitcoin uh, community. But the hate came from mostly the gold bug community. Mm -hmm. And um, and maybe Max, like when you hear with, you know, through John Matona, uh, what was your aha moment when you see like, oh, this is interesting or or do you also have like, oh, maybe this is a scam? <laughs> well, the aha moment is continuous. I mean, there's always a new aha moment. You know, there's there's the initial one, which was like, oh, this is a digital currency that's decentralized. So the when I was designing the uh my currency back in the 90s, you know, it's all very centralized and you're trying to create um, all the attributes of, uh, of, of money and, and a currency within a gaming platform. And so that was, oh, wow, you don't need it, but you could be outside of the platform. So that was the first aha moment. And then, you know, as you progress, you just get into it and you see how it gets deeper and deeper and how it competes more with central banks. So it's a really an ongoing thing. I don't, as uh, Jamison Lop says all the time, that the first thing to know about Bitcoin is that nobody knows anything about Bitcoin. So I think, you know, we're still learning stuff about Bitcoin. We're still learning how it, how it affects and impacts. I mean, even today, it's, it's interesting to see how Bitcoin really has, has, makes people who are public intellectuals and publicly intellectual and academics, they really start to transform and look right before our very eyes and they become they re kind of revert back to um, to to a non intellectual state, like who they were before they become public intellectuals. So they, we see their raw psychological beings, like maybe as children, how they how they were as kids, and before they became uh, disciplined academics. You know, so we're seeing this play out with people right now. And it, so Bitcoin has a way to to uh, disassemble people's minds and they and revert them back to ch children. So that's something I would never have anticipated with a with the virtual currency, but I've, something I've been observing in the last couple of years, and uh, how it how this is all going to play out. Uh, you know, the state of Louisiana just put in a special commendation to Bitcoin, uh, recognizing Satoshi and Bitcoin. That's you know, it's an interesting thing you didn't really think was in the cards. You know, so it's all playing out. You know, in real time, the way uh, central banks are reacting and the way um it, it's you know in my view i guess maybe five years five years ago i realized that bitcoin was on its own path really and and there's nothing that could stop it and it was on a path that was separate than any other path i call it a vector you know it's on a vector that doesn't hew to anything else that anyone has any experience with and it's just plowing through and um and then i and then i said you don't change bitcoin bitcoin changes you Right. So that's like one of my main messages. A lot of people show up and say, oh, I just read about Bitcoin and I'm here. To, I'm here to tell you how it should be changed. Right. The instant instant expert, that type of thing. And uh, they all you just watch them blow up in real time and never work. So I'm still having those aha moments all the time. You know, it's, it's like being in like traveling through outer space and you're seeing new galaxies all the time. And. And, and seeing new solar systems, you know, it's very interesting. I'm, 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 I'm old, you know, I'm 60, <laughs> I'm 61. So it's great to see new things. My contemporaries are all very, you know, cynical about, they've seen it all and they're not really open to seeing new things. Hmm. And uh, so they tend to uh, be, uh, you know, boring. Uh, here, because we're on rocket ship Bitcoin, there's no time to dilly dally. We have to stay alert because we're heading into the unknown. Wow. Yeah, that's very, very profound. Like, you know, that that Bitcoin 
somehow change us into the children mind, right? And uh, I think psychedelics also helps people to see things differently. Um, and some people see that you know when you're using psychedelics, you see the Uh, you see the world like a like a wonder of a you know from from the child's perspective, and I also like uh, that you guys also do the Orange Pill podcast, and I uh, would like to know uh, if let's say Orange Pill is actually a psychedelic, like as a comparison to psychedelic, what would be the Orange Pill experience looks like if someone took that psychedelic of Orange Pill. Well, Mac in a white wig, <laughs> me wearing my orange wig and drinking too much coffee. Oh, we have so much fun with it. It's like, you know, and it's, it's a balance. We do the microdose on Wednesdays and we do the full dose on Sundays and the microdose is live. So it's, it's more anarchic and stream of consciousness. Whereas the full dose, we get to sit back and, and think about things and contemplate ideas. And also we do an interview. Um, yeah, Bitcoin is itself like a psychedelic, you know, that the dissolution of ego and it, it forces it upon you. If you continue, you either have to drop out of Bitcoin and leave or get rid of your ego. So there's, you can't, you can't stay in it and um and you know be think you're bigger than it yeah and, it weeds out all the narcissists yeah yeah and you know everybody's on their own journey and that's the thing is some people come to it and boom they get it and they're like philosophers immediately others have been around for 10 years um you know there's some very very early users and and, and participants in the bitcoin space who obviously lost their way and you can see them. It's not like it it, na it automatically improves you. It, it might bring out the worst in you. Uh, you know, you can't get over your envy or hubris or whatever. Um, I do like the fact also that, you know, it, Bitcoin is evolving and you can see that in like sort of the how it mimics nature and thus creates a, the game theory of it. Like you have the difficulty adjustment, you have the hash rate, you have the, the you know, 10 minute blocks, you have the having, like there's all these certainties that are uncertain about like how big the block size is, like what, like what the, you know, wh when the actual, it's not every 10 minutes exactly, for example, like, There are so many variables that go into like when the having will come, all these sort of things. So um, I think it's 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 predictable and yet unpredictable, just like the seasons, just like the sometimes the flowers don't bloom one year. Sometimes they do like it. There's and yet they always will eventually. Right there. There's a cycle. It's like it feels more like nature and it feels like it's we're all watching it and observing and, and, and evolving ourselves while watching it. Right. It's deterministic. It's deterministic optimism. And, um, yeah. you know, the, uh, when, to get back on this uh, idea of uh, revealing one's childish self, I mean, there is a, during life, you know, one puts on different masks, you know, as in your, in your child, you don't really have a mask. You're just very natural and then and spontaneous. And then, you know, you go to school and you put on your school mask and then you go to work and you put on a work mask. And even now during the COVID crisis, everyone's putting on their COVID mask. So we have the many masks. And and so all Bitcoin removes all these masks. And for a lot of people, that's traumatic because they have grown in the, the mask has grown into who they are. You know, this is a theme really of ancient uh, theater, actually, you know, the mat where masks are become the character and the character becomes the mask and there's a lot more experimentation with the idea of masks in, in in the original theater going back many years ago and we don't we don't have that so much anymore we have we have methods of acting and techniques of acting which substitute for the mask but before all that was involved there was just a very rudimentary experimentation with an actual mask and um we live with these masks and people live behind a mask and this is where they live they because they 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 the 
the interface with the reality in life is it would be too painstakingly tedious to have to actually be yourself all the time. So you put in a proxy of yourself to serve as who you are to make it easier to get through the day because you don't want to spend three hours telling the mailman exactly how you feel. <laughs> so um, with Bitcoin, we start stripping away the masks and you're like, wait a minute, I feel naked. I feel exposed. You know, who am I? Where am I? And um, I think because we're in a relationship, we're already used to being honest with each other. We're already naked much of the time. So we're already into a naked state. So with Bitcoin, we're getting even more naked. And so that's part of our exploration of Bitcoin and the psychedelic nature of the Bitcoin exploration is just getting into a deeper state of nakedness. You know, William Burroughs wrote that great book, Naked Lunch. You know, he's a great mm, poet in terms of exploring the hidden juxtapositions of words and, and these things that he explored in great depth and was very interesting during that whole beat movement in American literature where like um, Kerouac wrote on the road in one, one take essentially, you know, he just put, he glued together 5,000 sheets of paper and banged it out in one session, you know, amphetamine fueled session and he banged out on the road. And a lot of people scoffed at that at the time, but it was um, a naked journey through the American heartland. And, um, you know, that's what Bitcoin is just opens all that stuff up. So you have to be, so it's psychedelic in that nature, you know, Timothy Leary and those people experimented with acid as a way to get into the inner self, to heal the inner self. It was very medicinal at that time and psychedelics and these types of things are used medicinally. And, uh, but with Bitcoin, it's done uh, on, a, on a different level because it, it attacks the primal uh, formation of the unconscious mind, which is our relationship to something called money. Mm -hmm. so our, the money is around which our human mind evolved because we evolved money, humans evolved along with money and dogs, <laughs> right? So we have an evolutionary relationship with dogs. And dogs and humans evolve concurrently. And, and, you know, for example, humans evolved whites in their eyes, as dogs do, so they can communicate silently while hunting. So here we are co-dependent, co-evolving dogs and humans. So we have a deeper, much deeper co-evolvement co relationship with money, what we call money, because it's our, it's our ticket to to exploration and curiosity and trade. And, and, and so Bitcoin attacks the most primal layer of our unconscious minds universally, simultaneously, instantaneously. So it's all happening instantaneously. We're all evolving now at the one quantum leap into a different species because our unconscious relationship to money is being redefined in real time, block by block with this wonderful discovery. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, I guess that's where the unveiling comes from. The like our current relationship with fiat money is so distorted. So, like when something medicinal, let's say Bitcoin is the medicine for this distorted relationship, makes people, um, yeah, suddenly like you know their head was like blown open by Bitcoin, etc. Uh, do you think? Uh, like, how do you see like the current state of, um, yeah, like uh, humans and also the fiat money? Right. So, so Bitcoin is like Medusa, and for some people, their heads turn to snakes and stone, and for some people, they become uh, anointed and enter into the sainthood. Mm -hmm. Like somebody like Andreas Antonopoulos, he he obviously was saint and became a saint through Bitcoin. Somebody like Nassim Taleb turned into stone. <laughs> so that was already pre-coded in their minds. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So we're at kind of at the, I think the, the separation of state and money. I think we had grown so used to it. It wasn't always like that. Like it, the state didn't always control money, but we got used to that over a thousand years. And it's, it's, uh, it's like that moment of the enlightenment when they realized, you know, the separation of the church and state. Imagine how euphoric 
and terrifying and exciting it must have been at the same time. It's like, oh my God, we don't need a king. Like he's not divine. And actually we could chop his head off. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> like, you know, that's a, that's unheard of at that time, right? You don't do that. And now we, we guillotined the central banks, essentially. The birthing of Bitcoin has done that. And once you realize it, I mean, a lot of people come into Bitcoin because, you know, they they want to speculate. They hear you can make a lot of money and buy a Lambo. And, you know, a, a lot of them will then uh, see that it's like way bigger than that. And that it's something worth way more than a Lambo ever will be. Mm -hmm. And um, so you talk about the separation about state and money. And uh, what will be the, your prediction? What's going to happen in the future when more and more people adopting Bitcoin? How is, how is it going to play out? Because we, as far as a lot of people in current generation can remember, banks is always be part of their life as well, central banks as well, and the current fiat money. So yeah, like what do you think is going to happen? Well, I think there's been a, a problem that you're seeing, especially in the past 20 years. Well, well, since 2008, especially, is that with fiat, with an all global fiat system, it's become apparent that in that system, the elite don't need the people at all. They could just print money. But now that we've just gone around them and have our own money, they, you know, there's more of a symbiosis then. Like the people, the governments, the elites, they, they need everybody. They need the consent of the people again. They need, you know, natural law reasserts itself. Um, and, you know, that sort of injustice of the fiat system, and it became apparent to everybody in the world, there's very few that could not have seen what has happened since 2008 and the huge explosion and gap up of the, the very, very, very wealthy and how, how wealthy they are, like absurd numbers now. And I think that sort of injustice is that the age of injustice of the fiat dark ages is over. And they, I don't think they can enforce it on us anymore. And they're going to try. We see them printing trillions of dollars now. We see them wanting to tax their trillions of dollars to kind of maintain some faith in that system. I think that's why you're seeing these like huge, uh, these weird claims of like, like let's double the tax and uh, make everybody believe in this system. Like if you've got to abide by us and our system. And I, I think those are those days are over. Right. What if I told you you could uh, destroy a building with your mind? <laughs> so the building would be the Federal Reserve Building in Washington, D.C. And in my mind, I have a seed phrase. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm wow. And if people understand this, then that building is destroyed. And we do it with our minds. So that's very godly. So just like Prometheus was given the gift of fire from the gods, humanity has been given the gift of the seed phrase <laughs> from the gods as well. And instead of burning the building down, we're simply going to make it disappear. Mm. And it will be gone. It will be converted to luxury housing or, <laughs> or something else. But uh, Jerome Powell will, will be gone and Kuroda in Japan will be gone and Christine Lagarde and the ECB will be gone. They'll be gone. And we did it with our minds. Wow. And how do you see when the nation right now will, like in the future, they won't get as much as control in the money. What will be the role of nation then? They're going to be just like during the days of Medici, right? They came begging Medici for money for their stupid wars. Right. Like he, he, he who has the Bitcoin will make the rules. They'll have to come begging us for permission to do anything. And we'll, we probably knowing most Bitcoiners, I don't think they'll grant them permission to go bomb anybody and take their stuff. I just don't think because that I mean, that's kind of unique in history, because remember, so, OK, Medici, you know, ran Florence, the Renaissance happened, cool stuff happened. But at the end of the day, like, they, the age of discovery, they came to America, took 
the native people's uh, land and stole stuff and things like that. Whereas if you travel around now as a Bitcoiner, you're a Bitcoiner, right? It doesn't matter what race, gender, nationality, culture, religion, everybody, like all these Bitcoin conferences, you go there, it's just filled with that relentless optimism and everybody and so much love and, and community of all nations and all people. So that is a, an interesting next step of, because that we've never really seen, I guess, since like, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago when we first were like tribes coming out of Africa, uh, spreading around the world. But I, I just don't I think that in, a, in the last thousand or 2000 years of history and recorded history, you can think of a time where, you know, we weren't divided by these groups like that, like the, around a geography. Right. So Bitcoin's making a 51% attack against the world's billionaires. So I was reading that within 10 years, half the world's billionaires will be Bitcoiners, which makes sense because if Bitcoin gets to two, three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 a coin, then those with a lot of Bitcoin right now will compose more than 50% of those at the very top of the wealth strata. So then you have a 51% attack that was launched against the billionaire class. And Bitcoin promotes peace, not war, because you can't get anything by violence or coercion like you can with fiat money. You can only get stuff by trading and you need to do so in a way that both parties are completely amicable, which is the purpose of money. It goes back to the very, very root unconscious of our beings. We want to trade with each other. We don't want to be violent with each other. And so perfect money would promote peace, not war. If, 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 if money promotes war, like fiat money does, it's not good money. It's terrible money. If the New York Times, if Jack Paul Krugman at the New York Times says, well, the dollar's backed by men with guns, that's an admission of having a really lousy form of money. Yeah. Right? Why would you want that money that only works if you are violent? I mean, that's the worst kind of money you could possibly imagine. And that's what we have. The important thing to pick up on with that, what he said about billionaires is like, if Jeff Bezos wants to meet with the president of the United States tomorrow, he can meet with the president of the United States tomorrow and he could probably impact or change or alter or introduce legislation. If Michael Saylor, who has tens of thousands of Bitcoin, wants to meet with Satoshi tomorrow and tell Satoshi to uh, rig the algorithm to help him gain more power, it's not going to happen. So he has just as much power as any anybody any pleb or some say plebe has over yeah. the protocol yeah a lot of billionaires play silly games they play power games they are horribly wasteful they stoke wars they stoke violence and as stacy is saying you know it doesn't matter if you had you know a ton tons and tons of bitcoin you cannot change the consensus algorithm you don't have power in that sense so your your mind goes to other places you're like you know what it's like larry ellison and bill gates have had this decades long competition who can accumulate the most fiat money, but because they can buy the biggest house in Malibu or they can fund a global vaccine program based on their patented technology or whatever. Okay. Well, you, you just dispense with all that in a Bitcoin world. You don't need to be, you know, the male species has a lot of shortcomings. I'll admit, uh, due to our biological legacy and uh, Bitcoin solves a lot of those testosterone problems that the, the world faces. Uh, similarly, in the, the female gender, there's also issues uh, which Bitcoin can help solve, you know? And uh, so there's much more harmony within the gender as well, which is much more peaceful. And um, the existence of fear, which is not a legacy emotion in our psyche, which is from the old days of being, of living with, the, you know, uh, 24 hour a day, constant existential threat from 360 degrees, right? Uh, we have fear that can be eliminated as well. We don't really need that fear. There's nothing to fear really. You know, when you become one with Bitcoin, you lose your fear. You know, mm -hmm. it's like if, I, if you become one with God, you know, God is just a, a weak version of Bitcoin, right? God is just a, a symbolic concept that of of what ultimately would be bitcoin you know if you become one 
you know, you, why, you, why are you afraid? You don't need to be fearful. What, what I see inter interesting is that the millennials who have embraced Bitcoin wholeheartedly are fearless. You can tell that they're a lot more fearless than, they, than my generation. I mean, you had the, the generation that went to war in World War II. They, and the Chuck Yeagers of the world and the Apollo astronauts, you know, there was a certain fearlessness about it. But that was uh, a minority of the population. Then you had um, the hard men gave birth to soft kids, right? Soft children who grew up in the, the lap of luxury in 20th century America and everything was cheap and plentiful and we ruled the world and we just went around the world and took everything and we didn't have any consequences. And then that resulted in 9-11 it resulted in the 2008 catastrophe of the economy. And the millennials are like, wait, wait, wait a minute, this, you know, when they, now they embrace Bitcoin and they're like the new greatest generation. They're the new fearless generation. They're, and they, 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 they just don't give a fuck. You know, they're like, you know what, we're gonna stack sats and we don't care if we crush boomers. You know, we eat boomers for lunch. Boomers are, have destroyed so much. To hell with the boomers. Right, COVID, it attacks boomers mostly. You know, that's who, who orchestrated that? Some millennial somewhere figured out how to go wipe out some boomers with this COVID, right? I mean, they're nasty. They're on the war path. They've got the hardest money ever. You're a millennial, I can tell. I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, <all> right. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> So it's very interesting. Um, yeah, I guess like with millennials, because they have nothing to lose, like their their wealth has been um, stolen from them for years. Right. And then they right now, their only resort is Bitcoin. And I also um, I think I watch a, one of a YouTube video from Robert Breedlove talking about uh, the early things about property rights is actually information and then the cool thing about Bitcoin is that this information is uncons you cannot cons confiscate that uh, information itself like you know um, because it doesn't have a physical physical um, form because everything is digital <clears throat> right well it's mysticism so in the old uh, days you know you would go to the witch doctor or the shaman who had the special information that only they had and they could perform acts of um you know they could deal with nature you know they they were able to, to to harness the forces of nature and they could cure people or they could help you know bring about a phenomenon like uh help uh the tribe in their in their political endeavors etc and so that shamanism has now been encoded into the protocol of Bitcoin and is available to anybody. So it gets back to psychedelia. You know, it's it's uh, psychedelia without the need of um, taking the psychedelia. It's like the these new COVID vaccines that are basically software driven. They're not like the old vaccines where you have to actually be injected with some actual uh, of the virus, right? That these new vaccines are um, virtual vaccines, they're, they're, they're algorithms. And, and so, and it's fighting the biological uh, virus. So this is an algorithmic money that's fighting the virus of legacy money, fiat money, paper money, central banks, the virus that we've had to uh, endure for the thousands of years of, of really terrible money, even though in our hearts, we yearn for perfect money and always have been. You know, that's why Jesus, the only moment you see Jesus get upset is when he's attacking the money changers. Even Jesus, you know, he's a man of peace. He went to the hall of the money changers and he went berserk. This, but this day was always going to come inevitably, even if Bitcoin hadn't arrived. Fortunately for everybody, Bitcoin did. And that is that, you know, you would arrive at a moment where the debt would come due because you can only roll over and, and, you know, when you're issuing all that debt, you're pulling forward consumption from the future, right? And we kept figuring out ways as you saw interest rates decline for the past 40 years. That was a way to figure out how to roll it further and further into the future. But inevitably you would run into that generation where um, it, there was no option at all. Like your whole life would be paying off the debt of, of the previous generations. So, this, this moment was always going to happen where you arrived at a generation 
that had nothing left to lose, as you mentioned, like, and that's freedom, right? As Janice Joplin would say, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. So if, if there's nothing for them in your system, they're not going to support your system. You, saw, you see that collapse in faith in the institutions of the United States and Western, all those central banks and banking system and the elite and the political classes, usually duopolies, and you see that. And what are they, the elite are trying to blame all these other nations, it's the internet, we need to deplatform all these people, they're, they're, they're congregating online, they're talking to each other, it's all conspiracy theories, we know what we're doing. But the fact is, there, there's nothing to be gained from their system, it, that's a closed system, uh, which is at the end of its, its 40 years of, of bull market and bonds, right? Yep, exactly right. There's a there's a, there's the end of the line, and um, so Bitcoin Bitcoin came around at the right time, and I don't exactly. think, I don't think it was um, by accident. I think it came around at the time when it came around because somebody in the in the cosmos loves us. We needed an escape valve, right? An exit. A way to yeah, exit. yeah, we are loved, you know, cosmically by the cosmic creator who mm -hmm. gave us the at the right time and to try to help us. Hopefully we'll, we'll survive. Yeah. And I think it's also a part of like collective consciousness, you know, like I think everyone consciously or unconsciously praying for some kind of a salvation from whatever um, problems that they have right now that is, you know, that is covered with fiat money and then Bitcoin comes and yeah, it's just, slowly helping people one by one and soon will be i guess around the world yeah definitely it's global mm -hmm. so i feel it you know you're in bali that's far far away you know and basically we're we're on the same singing the same song by the same composer mm -hmm. yeah i mean it used to be like oh you know even a few decades ago, you would travel and you would find your own communities or your restaurants that you were familiar with or blah, blah, blah. Like there was a familiar, you know, we shared common traits of being Americans, like hot dogs and apple pie and things like that. But now, like, don't you seek out Bitcoiners? Like, you know, you know exactly who and what they are and what they're, what they stand for. Um, a lot of nations, like the nation state format, like they don't stand for anything. It's just rapaciousness. It's, it's hollowing out, it's predatory. It becomes, it has to be predatory by the nature of a fiat debt system. It can't be anything else but that. Maybe in the very early days of it, when there's plenty of credit to go around and it doesn't need to be paid off for well into your 80s or 90s, you know, when you're super old, like, uh, you know, maybe then it was all nice and fun and like everything's going to be groovy, man. And um, but then you hit the you hit the, the point where it's, you can't roll it over anymore. And yeah, I mean, look, this is uh, similar to what we saw with uh, Bach, you know, who really invented modern music. And um, if you listen to Bach, you know, um, he is writing the music of God. And he said uh, at the time he felt he was writing the music of God. He wrote the music. He was the the, the composer for the church. And those those tunes are still played today. A lot of the Bach themes and the tunes are still embedded in much popular music that we hear today. And, and we, we are surrounded by Bach's music. And he was channeling, his, in his view, the, the God. And that he was in the church and he wrote the algorithms of music. So music is an algorithm. And he was able to write those algorithms down in, in a way that you could reproduce them on a sheet of paper anywhere in the world, could do a Bach composition and connect with God. So now apply that to software. So this is a software that connects us to God. And so um, that's what it is. It's Bach. You know, uh, of Satoshi is the Bach of, of software. You know, he's, he's, he's invented this new form of money. He's invented this new way to create global consciousness. You know, we all sing, we can all sing those songs simultaneously. And uh, fortunately, there's no cynicism to it. You know, re people remember in that 
that show Mad Men at the end where they are all singing a song together in, in the service of selling a soft drink. I want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, which was uh, an ad by Coca-Cola. And that's a very cynical view of the world that we can use something like music to sell high fructose corn syrup and make the population a beast. So when COVID comes around, they all die, right? That's, the, that's what we have to fight. We fight the devil. We fight the posers. We fight the, the they keep the mask firmly on. They don't, they're not real. They're not human. They, they work for the malevolent underworld and dark forces. And, but they use the similar tropes and ideas and colors and things, and they trick us. But Bitcoin is on, not only is it unconfiscatable, but it's immutable. And no devil, no devil can come and change, change the source code because they don't have the computer power. It's written in a way that it, the devil gets tired. Ultimately, the, you can try a 51% attack, but at the end of the day, the devil is a lazy, very lazy, lazy. You know, they, they have it, they've had it too good for too long. And now they, they just don't have the energy to, 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 to defeat Bitcoin. Bitcoin is our passage to the eye of the needle into the paradise. Which is which is happening now, and it's happening to people all over the world. Now, our our experience over ten years by creating Bitcoin millionaires all over the world, and we've created hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin millionaires all over the world. You know, people who put five thousand dollars into Bitcoin back when it was a dollar, obviously they're sitting on a lots and lots of personal sovereignty, individual sovereignty. They can essentially listen to what their government is saying and say, well, that's very amusing, but you can go fuck yourself. Because I, you know, it's funny when Janet Yellen at the Treasury says, we're thinking about taxing Bitcoin at 90%. That was a, that was a fake article. But that, even that, if that it's was... a fake article. But what's funny about it is that the truth is that within a very short period of time, the message from Treasury will be, we're, you are, we will be able to pay your taxes. If you use Bitcoin, we'll give you a 90% discount. Yeah. Now, we, we are desperate for Bitcoin. We, we totally ignored it all the way up to 300, 400,000. And now our fiat money has gone belly up. And, you know, the only buddy around is the devil offering us, you know, high fructose corn syrup and uh, opiates. You know, we want to escape. And we're like, well, you know, like Noah and the ark. It's like, you can get on the ark now and avoid the flood, you know, or you can stay out there and, and do your silly games. And when the flood comes, you know, you're going to be drowning to death and we're going to be laughing because you're a moron. There is a history for that, right? With the tally sticks. So the British Empire grew under uh, and industrialization. That was, you know, they led industrialization and they did that under the tally stick regime where you got a discount on your taxes, you know, using the tally stick essentially. So it was a way to give the government money um, if you were going to owe a hundred thousand in taxes, you gave them 80,000 and that the, the uh, tally stick, and that was your discount rate was 20%. So, yeah, I mean, one thing I've noticed, you know, since I've been involved in markets and finance now for almost 40 years, and I've seen several bull markets, I've seen several crashes. I've seen many, many cycles, many products, many things. And this is the first time in 40 years that when the government starts talking high taxes, there's a vast amount of the population saying, well, we're just going to move to another country. <laughs> we'll go to a country that is going to treat us right. We're not going to stick around. Mm. Uh, you know why? It's particularly, I mean, as, as Stacy was saying yesterday, if taxes in the U.S. are going to be similar to Europe, but without the edu free education or the subsidized or state organized education, without the state organized healthcare, without the state organized transportation system. And we lived in France for decades, you know. Six, six weeks vacation guaranteed. <laughs> right, you know, the thing is the taxes in Europe and France, for example, you, you can live like unbelievably well in, in France uh, for very little because the state runs those things that the state should be running, healthcare, education, transportation, to name three. I will say that um, having uh, participated in the French healthcare system, the state does not actually run it like in the UK. The state runs the healthcare system. The doctors there are employees of the government, whereas in France they are all independent and private. But the state says, like, sets the prices on X-rays, MRIs. Like here in America, an X-ray could cost you one hundred dollars at that location, or ten thousand for the same exact 
uh, x-ray. It's all random and however much they can bilk you for. Whereas the government there, um, you know, basically it, they fix the price on, on basics, but also there are um, state-backed insurance companies. They can't bilk you like they do here. They just, in America, the, the insurance companies just don't pay out any claims, whereas they there they have to. But um, anyway. Right. So you, why, if you're going to pay the same amount of tax as you do in, in Europe, okay, in, in the better. U.S., and you don't get anything, you don't get any of those services, you just get, you, you, know, you just get war. ripped off. War. Right. right. You get wars and, and all these other problems. Right. There's, there's no incentive to stay. And if I have a seed phrase with my wealth, it's unconfiscatable and I can go naked to the airport and get on a plane naked and go anywhere in the world uh, where they're going to give me some respect. Well, I'm, I'm going to do that. So and that's the first time. That's what it means to separate state from money. The state believes they have a monopoly and the people who work for the state still believe they have a monopoly and an enforceable monopoly and that they are in the driver's seat and that they will have we have no recourse. They still believe that, even though Bitcoin has been around now for 12 years, they still don't understand it. They still are leaning on this idea that they can coerce uh, all of our time in the form of our wages and money and assets out of us. And they're 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 deeply, deeply wrong. So I, the first time I've seen this in 40 years. So in my personal experience. I, and historically, if I read history, this is the first time this has ever happened in history. We've had separation of church and state. We've never had separation of money from state. And it's never happened globally, spontaneously, instantaneously, like it is now. And, um, you know, th this is uh, a new thing. And the state, to answer your question, what will happen to the state, the state will wither. You know, the state essentially does two functions that, at the core. They pick up garbage. Right, which is they're good at. We have people work for us to pick up our garbage, and and they also uh, we have uh, the state. Uh, we employ a uh, police force that is very tightly, you know, over. Oh, there's a lot of oversight there. Uh, at the moment, um, we you know the state has reneged on their responsibility to provide uh, policing in in states and communities all over America. Which, which is a, which is a which is a see a break of the social contract, right? The social contract, as John Locke envisioned it, is uh, there's a quid pro quo between the citizen and the state. Okay, they provide services, I pay taxes. You know, some of the, one of the basic services you've got to protect me. If you don't protect me, it, it, there's no municipal police that's breaking down everywhere. Then I'm okay. You took my money and you ran away with it, like like Jamie Dimon or something. Like what do you what the what are you doing there? You didn't fulfill the contract contract social contract right that's not negotiable we're not picking through this on a daily basis like well maybe we should have police maybe we shouldn't maybe they need to wear gray uniforms maybe they wear blue uniform we don't know what is it i don't care no you broke the contract so there's consequences those consequences are we leave and you're left alone with the devil and you're shooting up smack in the alleyway that's your consequence deal with it mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people also said that, you know, uh, what we are seeing is just people are splitting into two sides, the one that's going to destroy themselves and the one is going to, yeah, just like live freely with Bitcoin and uh, other means like, you know, permaculture, etc. Build, build our own uh, society kind of like that. So, yeah, I think I think that's slowly what's what is happening right now. I agree. Uh, and Max and Stacy, um, I think that like, we are about at the end of the uh, the show. But I think this is also a question that a lot of people uh, want to know because a lot of people knows about Max's story that you are like working in the Wall Street and then starting the um, <clears throat> the show like Iso Report, etc. So uh, my question is, how do you guys two met? Like, what was the story behind you two? And then how did you end up hosting Kaiser Report together? <laughs> right. So we met in the year 2003. And uh, I, I was living in the south of France. Stacy was visiting this town in the south of France, Villefranche-sur-Mer. And uh, we happened to be in the same internet cafe as they were known at that time, at the same time. So I walked in. The owner said, oh, Max, meet Stacy." She's here for a few days and uh, she's a writer like you are. 
So we started chatting and we've been together now for more than 18 years. And uh, after, a, after uh, a couple of years, we decided to do the uh, content because Stacy has background, as she, as she mentioned, in script development. And she was working in, in London at uh, BBC and other places to, uh, for script uh, development and developing projects and things like that. And um, a con concurrent with my Wall Street background, I was also involved in media for a long time. I've done many media thing outlets for many years. So we decided to do um, some something and at that time. It was before podcasting was invented. You know, we just did basically what was now called podcasting and and um, that's how we got started. And then our big break came, I guess it was 2000. And when did Al Jazeera? So we hit? were we started making a podcast before they're called podcasts in 2004. Maybe it was late 2003, early 2004. And um, we would record little radio shows and have to compress the file below four megabytes because most people had dial up. So I had to, it would take like 10 minutes to download a four megabyte file. So we had to compress it down and, and scrunch it up and host it on our own website and provide a link so people could download it. Then um, the, the podcast, we were also, you know, basically it got attention in London in a, in a like a, a little magazine there called Private Eye. And Al Jazeera executive Richard Dove was reading through it and read about our podcast, which we didn't know because there was no online situation then. That magazine still isn't really online too much. But nevertheless, um, they emailed us when he went to set up Al Jazeera English in 2005 and asked if we could do a um, basically a short film for them similar to our podcast. You know, Max being very funny and talking hard hitting stuff about the banking system. So that's what we did. Our first one was called death of the dollar. And um, so we talked about the U S dollar and um, its role in the world. And uh, yeah, that was how, well, that was kind of our big break was the style just their English. We ended up making 10 films for them. And, um, and then that's really, you know, from there we, we started doing more international broadcasting and um, then we had a radio show in Paris for for a couple of years that was very interesting called uh, that was on a station called Paris Live Radio and uh, Le Frick Show. Le Frick Show. Le, was, Le Frick means money. Money. Like, money. So we had this uh, and it was up in um, the Pigalle in the basement of the Moulin Rouge. You know, the Moulin Rouge is a very famous uh, club in uh, Pigalle in Paris and in the basement area they had set up a studio and this entrepreneur from New Zealand had created this radio station. And so we did, uh, we were doing radio uh, there for a while. Um, and uh, we, we started doing some live shows because we have a big audience. It's kind of, uh, I would say an underground audience really, because we're not really mainstream. It's still, we're still out of the mainstream. And we have a lot of um, like an underground audience. So we started doing like main, uh, live shows, which uh, people, you know, would come you know, by the hundreds, really. And, 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 you know, we would just, you know, I, I do a thing called stand up rage, where I'm just raging, you know, for an hour and a half. And it's very cathartic and for, for, for people, you know, uh, we did Especially one, him. Yeah, before the lockdown, we did one in uh, Mexico City, which was uh, fantastic. Mexico, Mexico, and Mexico City are incredible audience for us. They love us. We love them. They're incredible. They're into Bitcoin, as all Latin America is totally into Bitcoin because of all the economies and all the currencies are collapsing, and so uh, that's where it's, that's where the action is. In Latin America and in Nigeria, you know, this is where the Bitcoin life is really taking hold and transforming nations and, and countries. Not so much in the U.S. because the U.S. is home of the U.S. dollar, so it's really the benefit, the beneficiary of world reserve currency. So it's going to be probably one of the last countries to really understand Bitcoin. And, and adopt Bitcoin, but the rest of the world is very anxious. And we saw a comment from China recently where they flipped. They went from being really anti-Bitcoin. They're now saying things like, well, you actually, we, we recognize Bitcoin as something powerful. So that's an amazing transformation. So now you've got the biggest economy in the world now starting to be aligned with Bitcoin. At some point, they will announce they've got Bitcoin in their strategic reserves, along with their gold and their other currencies. And that will completely and utterly change the global dynamic on that day. 
And uh, that's happening. That's happening now. It's happening in real time. I also think, you know, there's a, a great chart you can find online and it's the, the, the tree of languages. And it just shows you from the, the root up, like how languages evolved. Most of like the Indo-European languages, like hundreds of languages that they're all related to each other. And it kind of feels like what now looking back um, 10 years ago, when we first started covering Bitcoin is like that we're in that, that root, that the, the trunk of the tree stage where Max and I were with a bunch of like, you know, the Bitcoin talk chats and stuff like that. There were just a few people there, but we were dropping seeds because of the unique thing about Kaiser Report is it goes all over the world. It's like, so it was broadcast everywhere around the world, all of Latin America, Asia, Middle East, everywhere, Europe, uh, from a dollar when Bitcoin was a dollar. So it was airdropped to, the knowledge was airdropped to everybody around the world who, if they were listening and actually heard it and absorbed it, were participants in it. So I think it's like, I feel like we're part of that early tree of, of, of Bitcoin. And now there's like loads of podcasters and, and thinkers and philosophers and writers and blogs. And it's just like so much amazing content. It's hard to keep up with it, but you know. Yeah, it, yeah, we, we were the first to do Bitcoin related content. So all Bitcoin related content refers back to us in some way. You know, we are the, the Adam and Eve of Bitcoin related content. And we had that position for several years. It wasn't until 2017 and the fork wars when you had a really um, a moment when there was World Crypto Network on YouTube. Three or four Bitcoiners got together and they did programming and content. That was that was uh, that was different than what we were doing. That that was attracted its own audience. And it built up an audience. And that was the beginning really of another stage of content. So that so from 2011 through 2017, essentially, there was only the only content that was broadcast globally was Max and Stacy content. So um, that's that's the history of it. That's that's the way it was. Mm. Well, with on behalf of everyone in the world, thank you so much for your hard work, like you know, about spreading the word about Bitcoin. And I'm sure like, you know, even up until now, you are still leading with your content as well. Um, so I think we are about to wrap up. Uh, so everyone, uh, if, the, if people want to uh, connect with you, uh, your Twitter handle is... Uh, well, just be aware as well of many, many fakes. I must say that because it's uh, the imposters plague YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we're definitely not, we hardly are ever at all on Instagram or Facebook. So if you're, I, I we see people always saying they're in, in contact with me and I'm like, no, you're not <laughs> actually. So <laughs> our real, real Twitter handle is Stacy Herbert, S-T-A-C-Y-H-E-R-B-E-R-T. His, his real handle is Max Kaiser, M-A-X-K-E-I-S-E-R. But the easy one to follow where you can always get the truth and find out whether or not you're really communicating with us is to just go to telegram t.me forward slash orange pill and go in there we're there uh and we have great moderators in there and a really great crew of, of people in there so twenty four thousand really cool bitcoiners from around the world so you know you'll, you'll always find a home it's it's open 24 7. it's all bitcoin and oral orange pill relentless optimism yeah Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Max and Stacy. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend as well. Oh, thanks. Thank you for listening to the My Bitcoin Story. Stay tuned for more episodes and click that follow button.